John chapter 18, as we attempt to try to finish this tonight, I know last week we looked at Peter's denial, we looked at in the garden, the uh, as they take Jesus and they, they cut off uh, Malchus's ear, we looked at those details. So the second half of the chapter, we're going to look at these two trials, and we're going to look at how they essentially put God on trial. Now can you imagine, I mean just, just saying that phrase seems contrary to human flesh. Who are we to put God on trial? But this is exactly what they're going to attempt to do. They're going to judge Jesus by his words to see if he said something that they can find wrong with what he said. There were no actions that he did that were worthy of death, but his claim of being the Son of God, they said, was blasphemy and worthy of death in the religious trial that he had to undergo. And then there was this uh, public uh, political trial, if you will, or secular trial. And, of course, they're accusing him of sedition as if he said he would overthrow the government. Again, it all comes back to Jesus' words. But many of these people were eyewitnesses of amazing miracles that were evidences that he was God. So here they go to put God on trial. And you think about this, Jesus is the creator of us all. All things are sustained by him. He is the judge of all the earth. And here they're going to put the judge on trial. This is a really deep concept when you think about it. As I've meditated on this, you know, who is Pilate to put Jesus on trial? Who is Annas to put Jesus on trial? How dare Caiaphas put Jesus on trial? But you know what? We all do this at some point in our life. Haven't you judged Jesus in a sense? Haven't you judged Him? You believe the words that He spoke and you count Him as your Savior, your King, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Son, the seed of Abraham that was promised, that seed of David. You believe that these prophecies are true and that Jesus was the one making Him the Christ, the, the Savior, the Messiah. And so thereby you have judged Him according to His words you have determined the verdict. And that's what they're going to do tonight. And that's, that's one thing I want you to ponder as we go through this is, uh, what is your verdict? What is your verdict? What is your verdict? Every one of you, teenager, child, wife, husband, Adult or young, young or old, you have to make your own verdict on whether or not you believe that Jesus is the judge of the earth. Whether or not he is the creator, the savior, as he says that he is. And this is something that we're all required to do with our time here on earth. We're going to see first how Jesus was sent to the high priest over blasphemy. We'll see Annas and Caiaphas who are related. And then we'll see that secular trial where he's sent to the judgment hall. And at the judgment hall by Pontius Pilate, the governor. So he goes from high priest to governor to ruling authorities in this realm in Jerusalem at the time. And we'll look at the result of that. Now I want to uh, start in John 18, verse number 12. John chapter 18, look at verse number 12. Then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. Now, of course, this still blows my mind. They bound him. They tied up the guy that literally said, I am he, and they fell back. They tied up the guy that saw, they saw somebody's ear cut off, and he healed the ear. He put it back on without surgery. It was a miracle. And that same guy that lost his ear picked up a rope and tied up Jesus as if he was going to hold him captive. Think about this. Verse 13, And they led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And when we preached John 11, we looked at this. Go back to John 11 real quick. I just want to touch on it while we're here. Uh, of course, Annas and Caiaphas seemed to have a revolving door. It was like a family business where they continued to be the high priest and perhaps there were more that were uh, during their 10 years that we don't see, but we do see the account of both of them being high priests at different times. It was typically a yearly office and it was like one was letting the other back and forth, you know. Sounds like politics in our day a lot of times, right? Uh, but so they held some power, uh, spiritually speaking, religiously speaking, because at this time in Jerusalem, you know, you have to consider that their whole life revolved around being able to go into the synagogue, having access to give sacrifice. They believed the law of Moses. They looked for Christ to come. They believed these things, and they were trying to be obedient. And the men at the top of the system were corrupt. They were evil. 
I mean, some of them outright had devils and hated the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. You're in John chapter 11. Go to the end. Go to verse 49. John chapter 11, verse 49. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all. So here, they're concerned. He's doing miracles. What are we going to do? That we're going to lose our power and our, our influence, right? And he says, Ye know nothing at all. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. This is such an odd prophecy. At a glance, it may seem that as he filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesying that Christ would come to deliver the people. And you, you kind of see that because that ends up being the reality, but that certainly was not his intention. He's literally saying, this Jesus that's doing miracles must die so we don't lose our nation. We must kill him so we don't lose our political place. In fact, he almost uses it as if his death would bring about the kingdom there uh, through this human sacrifice that he's talking about. And I believe that he has a wicked heart in what he's saying. And we see that as you look at the character and the prophecies of Caiaphas in other locations like in the book of Acts. So continue in verse 51, John 11, verse 51. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together to put him to death. What a, what a strange concept here. He's literally prophesying, if we kill this Jesus, we can gather together all the Jews that are lost and bring them together. And it's interesting that there is a truth in what's happening here is that Christ really did bring all of the true children of God together, not just those that were affiliated with a religion. If you would go to Matthew chapter 26. Go to Matthew chapter 26 and find your way to verse 59. So first, Jesus is brought to Annas, who is father-in-law, to Caiaphas. This religious trial was beginning. They had captured him. They wanted to catch him in his words. Uh, and notice they didn't do it openly and in the day. They didn't do it in the synagogue. Many times they accused him of blasphemy when he said that God was his father. They picked up stones to stone him, right? Uh, John 5, John 8, John 10. You see this pattern happening where, boy, they really want to get him. They want to kill him. And they finally figure out a way. And here is, is what we're learning tonight in John 18. And Matthew 26 is part of a parallel. If you'll find verse number 59. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council, listen, sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. Now where is their heart in this? Boy, these are the religious crowd of our time. These are the John MacArthur's of our day, right? These are the Billy Graham's of our day. These are the, these are the guys that are known as the high priests. They walk through town. Everybody knows them, and, and, and they, don't know, they don't know the bum in the ditch, but the bum in the ditch knows who they are. They're, they're a man of stature and of religion, and they're closest to God, if you will, according to that man-made construct of how re the religion had come. And again, I, I always say it, that Judaism was hijacked at the time of Jesus. It was not what God had intended. Just as much today, Christianity has been almost completely hijacked. It, was, it is not what God had intended. Most people, when they hear Christian, they think Catholic, and boy, is that so wrong and pagan and weird. has nothing to do with what the Bible teaches. But even in uh, mainstream Christianity, or let's narrow it down and go evangelical, or even a lot of Baptist churches, there are a lot of things that go on, and they preach a doctrine that you can't even choose to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ yourself. Either God picked you. Listen, Christianity has been hijacked. This is a big deal. Most mainstream uh, name known prophets out there are not truly prophets of God. Most of them are not even saved and they're leading others astray in the wrong way. So this is exactly what he was dealing with here. Now here, the chief priest, the elders, now elder does not mean pastor. Uh, elder means older. It was tradition in every, in every country that you had elders that typically ruled. It's a good thing when a pastor is an elder. 
it's a good thing when the older men of the church are used as wise counsel to make decisions. This was uh, part of the judgment, you know, in the gate, the elders would gather. So the elders that had been around for a while, lived life a little bit, had some wisdom, uh, and the elders and the chief priests and the council, which is probably what they call the Sanhedrin, sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. Everybody that was somebody had come together and realized if we don't get rid of him, they're going to ruin what we have going on. He's going to take away our power and our influence and our wealth or affluence or whatever they had influence over people. Because you imagine, uh, human nature is that you want to buy something from God. You want to work your way to heaven. And as the high priest comes walking by, you know, perhaps you're a merchant and you sell things. You, Here you go, priest. This one's for free. Take one of these for free and I'll, I'll bless God through you. And so I'm sure they all had some sort of a benefit in that office and it had kind of gone to their hearts. They were rotten to the core. They hated the Son of God when He came down and worked these amazing miracles that they were eyewitness to. They knew about Ju uh, uh, Lazarus dying and coming back. And for that, primarily, they wanted to put Him to death. Continue in verse number 60, Matthew 26, verse 60. But found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the same, at the last, came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. So what charge do they have against him? Oh, he's going to destroy our house. He's going to destroy our building. That's the evidence we have. What's interesting in Mark, the parallel of this in Mark 14, uh, the, the witness says this, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. And in three days, I will build another made without hands. Even the statement that they make kind of makes you realize he's probably not really talking about tearing the bricks down out of a building and putting the bricks back up. This is something supernatural. There was obviously speaking of his own death, burial, and resurrection within three full days, and he made that clear. Continue in verse 62, Matthew 26, 62. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? Answerest thou nothing? What is it with these witnesses against these? He says, don't you hear what they're saying? Aren't you going to defend yourself? Answer us thou nothing. Now, it's interesting that Jesus uh, was not retaliating. He was not answering back. These men were clearly false witnesses. And how do you answer a false witness? Well, according to Proverbs, sometimes you answer not a fool according to his folly. Sometimes it's best to keep silent and let them just keep lying, knowing that their day's coming and God will get them and God will bring everything out and show the truth in time. In Isaiah 53, it says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. The dumb there means mute. He wasn't speaking. He didn't open his mouth. He had nothing to say. He's standing before men that were religious leaders of the time that were living the system and the law that he himself spoken to man and given to man as a picture of him to come and they were rejecting his coming. And so what do you think he could say to them? He had nothing to say. They didn't understand. It didn't matter what he said. They wouldn't receive it. Look at verse 63. But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. So finally he stepped it up a little. He's like, according to God, I want you to swear on God's name that you are the Son of God, if that's what you're claiming. And what did Jesus say? Verse 64, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said. He says, You said it, buddy. Right? Put it in your own vernacular. Put it in your own language. You got it. Um, you figured it out, didn't you, right? In fact, in a parallel, uh, he says in, Mar in Mark 16, he, they, when they said, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. Couldn't be any more clear than that, could you? He said, I am, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. He's saying, yeah, I am, and yet you're going to see something miraculous. Continuing in Matthew 26, 64, he says, Jesus saith, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. 
What was his blasphemy? Are you the Son of God? I am. Are you, are you, the, are you the Christ, the Savior? You said it. And they're calling that blasphemy after seeing the miracles that he worked. Denying, hardening their hearts to the truth. 66, he says, What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. That's the, hey, he's guilty of death. Clearly, he, he claimed to be our Savior. He's guilty of death. Then they did spit in his face and buffeted him. Others smote him with the palms of his hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? Jump ahead to Luke 22. Go to Luke chapter 22 near the end of the chapter. I just want to show you a couple parallels before we get back to John 18 and continue it. In uh, Luke 4, or I'm sorry, Mark 14, it tells us that they put a bag over his head. And when, so when they smack him in the head, imagine what they're doing to Jesus. They put a bag over his head and they smack him and they say, if you're God, tell us who hit you. Just reviling him, blaspheming him, uh, uh, just making fun of him and scorning him for no reason, for no cause. When you get to Luke 22, find verse 67. Again, a parallel. Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, ye will not believe. What a statement. He said, If I tell you, you're not even going to believe. I've already told you and you didn't believe it. If I tell you something now, you're not going to believe it. Verse 68. And if I also ask you, you will not answer me nor let me go. And, and there's many times, you know, they tried to uh, get Jesus on... Uh, well, what they say? Let me see. It was uh, John the Baptist they asked about, and he asked them a question they couldn't answer. They tried to get him on keeping the Sabbath, where they couldn't answer. You know, they tried to every time they tried to get him on. So, what about this money? <laughs> Whose money is that? Right? Boy, they couldn't answer. You understand? Jesus had more wisdom when it comes to the Bible and God's law than they did, and they figured that out. They're, they're, they just couldn't answer. So he, did, instead of answering during this trial, he held his peace. Instead of giving up his peace and getting angry and trying to fight back with his words, he had already said plenty enough. And he said, well, why don't you ask them? I've already told you. Look at verse 68. He said, and if I ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then, they said, then said they all, art thou the Son of God? And he said unto them, ye say that I am. And they said, What need we any further witness? We ourselves, we have heard out of his own mouth. Now go back to John 18. This is the beginning of that religious trial. And the Jews, according to their trial, begin to persecute Jesus. And they have decided, according to the high priest, that Jesus was worthy of death for the words that he spoke. Can you imagine him living in such a time? I hardly think... And listen, we are losing liberty in America faster than at any point in the history of America. But can you imagine losing your life for speaking words? Not throwing punches, not shooting or pulling a sword, but for your words. And they're words of peace. They're words of life. And they're ready to kill Him. Notice they've put God on trial here, haven't they? They put Jesus, the Son of the Blessed, on trial and their verdict is crucify Him. This really is heartbreaking because this is the same crowd that just a few days earlier was saying, Hosanna! Hosanna! Right? This is God! He's going to save us! And now they're saying crucify Him. Here in John 18, look at verse number 19. The high priest then asked Jesus of His disciples and of His doctrine. So here the interrogation really begins. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. He says, everything that you want to know has already been said. You heard it. I didn't hide it from you, right? I said it openly. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. And that's the problem. They knew also, and they didn't like it. They were ready to kill him for his testimony. Continue in verse 22. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? He says, Who are you to back talk the high priest? Right. So he smacks Jesus. Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? 
He says, if I'm smoking good things, why are you hitting me? If I said something that was hurtful or harmful or wrong or a lie or deceptive or destructive, then bear witness. Where's your testimony? Here, you're asking me what I said. And I said, you know what I said. Ask them. And so when I repeat that to you, you hit me with no reason for no cause. Their heart, their heart was wrong here. Look at verse 20. I'm sorry, where are we at? Let's see, verse 24. 24, thank you. Now, Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. So, again, he's talking about how one had him and then sent to the other. Jump ahead to verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas unto the judgment hall. I'm sorry, the hall of judgment. And it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. So here's the transition. Here's the transition. What's happening? Uh, the Jews are done with him. They smite him. They hit him. They, they tie him up. They falsely accuse him. They get liars to come testify. They have nothing on him. Are you the son of God? Are you the king of Israel? Yes, I am. I am. You said it. You know, he gives these responses they don't like. They say, blasphemy, he's worthy of death. Send him to Pilate. We have what we need. The Jews have decided he's worthy of death. Therefore, let's have the Romans kill him. It's interesting how much of a threat they saw Jesus when you really think about it. I mean, Jesus was a pretty harmless person as he walked the earth, wasn't he? He wasn't tearing down buildings. He wasn't starting revolts. He wasn't uh, known for hating people. I mean, if anything, we see like, what, Matthew 23, where he really gave it to the, the religious leaders for their hypocrisy. And you think about the hypocrisy of this statement here. Now, the Jews did their part in their chambers as quickly as they could. And then they tie him up and they send him here. Now, but notice what he says in verse 28 here. They send him to the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Hold your place here and go to Matthew 23. Hold your place here and go to Matthew 23. Uh, think of the hypocrisy. They're in the middle of committing murder based on a lie. They've got false witnesses to come and lie against somebody. They've decided we're going to murder him because he's stealing our power, but they're not going to go into the political court because if they do, they'll be defiled and they won't be able to eat the Passover. Talk about living the letter of the law, but not the spirit. Well, we keep this feast and we're going to do it according to what the feast says and we're going to be clean and separated and pure. But it's okay to lie and murder. What, what hypocrisy. You're in Matthew 23, look at verse 2. Saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Right, they're given the law. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe. That observe and do, but do ye not after their works, for they say and do not. I, I, I can't go in there, I'll defile myself. You're already defiled. You're murdering God? You're going to try to murder your Savior? Murdering the Messiah? Verse 4, For they bind heavy burdens, and grievous to be born, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do, for to be seen of men, they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. What's he saying? They're total hypocrites. Everything they do is just so you see them. They want you to see how holy they are, but God sees their heart just how rotten and wicked and deceptive they are. Now jump down to verse 23. Matthew 23, verse 23. And here he, he gives us the example showing how hypocritical they are. Woe unto you. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not leave the other undone. He says, listen, you, you keep the law so squeaky clean and tight. I mean, what's he say? Look at it. He says you pay tithe. That means you take 10% of your income when you pick some mint out of the garden or some coming out of the garden you pick some herbs out of your garden oh you pick 10 leaves of mint i'm taking one to the church and putting it in the offering plate so everybody will see that i give tenth of all that i have but he says you've omitted the omitted the weightier matters judgment and here what we're reading tonight aren't they judging the judge of the earth unrighteously mercy did jesus do anything really worthy of death 
and faith and here's the, here's the real key they didn't have faith they didn't believe in God they weren't saved Look at verse 24, Matthew 23, 24. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. You focus in on one little thing. And listen, here's the warning. Listen, that these people, are, are uh, they flip-flop. We, in our human nature, have a tendency to say, Hosanna one week and crucify him in the next week. And here he says, here's the worst example of it. We strain at one little thing. We want to find our brother or sister and pick him apart for that one little thing but then we put up with some real big things elsewhere. We ought not to be hypocrites like this. This is something for us to learn from. Look what he says, uh, 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. And that's extortion. What does that mean? Is that like bribing somebody with 30 pieces of silver? Whoa. Think about this. You inside, well, we're clean on the outside, but we're in the middle of murdering somebody. Verse 26, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Jesus' instruction to all would be get your heart right with God first and then clean up your life. Get saved first and then start working on the sin that's besetting you. Verse 27, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you're like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. He's saying you're like, you go to the graveyard, you say, look at that beautiful gravestone. And there's corruption and death on the inside. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men. But within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Go back to John 18. Just so you can understand what's happening here. Jesus is really... Think about uh, th this, what they're doing. Well, we can't go into the judgment. We can't step inside of there because you know, we don't want to be unclean. We want to be able to keep the Passover. John 18, look at verse number 29. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would have not delivered him up to thee. They can't even answer. Why did you bring him here? Was he guilty of it? Well, if he wasn't a criminal, we wouldn't have brought him to court. Okay, but what are we charging him with here? Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. Which they've already done that. Look, he says, The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. Ah, now we're getting to the truth of it. It's all about whatever it takes to put him to death. We're only here because we want him to die. Look what he says next. He says, That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. You know, it, it was said that, you know, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. Well, what type of death is he talking about? Obviously, he foreknew the crucifixion. Before he laid the foundation of the world, before he spoke it into existence, he knew who he would die for and what sins they would commit and how they'd be forgiven and who would choose to believe. He knew all of that, yet he still chose to enter the world and suffer for us and go through this process. Verse 33, Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, because Jesus is in there. The Jews are out there. He's back and forth. And called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Now what did he say earlier in Mark? He said, I am. Right? Art thou the king of the Jews? Is it true? Are you really a king? Jesus answered him, Sayest this thou thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee? So Jesus still not even really answering him, but why are you saying that? Did somebody else tell you of that, or are you asking? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? He said, Well, hold on. Well, self incriminate yourself, would you? Did you break a law? What law was it? Why are you in front of me? Go to Matthew 27 real quick. Go to Matthew chapter 27. Go to Matthew chapter 27. Look at verse number 11. And Jesus stood before the governor. And the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. He said, you said it, buddy. That's right. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? He answered him to never a word. 
insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now think about this. Here's Pilate. He's in charge. He's the governor. He has the power of death and life in his hand. With the stroke of a pen or the point of the sword or whatever it may be, put him to death. I have judged him worthy of death. Now here is the judge Pilate judging the judge Jesus who will judge all souls at one time. Right? Now imagine, uh, now, now as we speak today, Pilate has partially received some of his judgment, hasn't he? Yeah. Pilate will probably receive more judgment in eternity. This was such a trial as they put God on trial here. And you think of the judgment that they're making here. Here's Pilate trying to figure out, can I kill this guy? Should I kill this guy? Why is he here? I'm the judge. Not yet figuring it all out, discerning who he's dealing with. But I, I believe that he knew he was dealing with a higher power already. Jesus had quite a reputation before he got there. Uh, but notice as he's saying this, he answered him to never a word, it says in verse 14, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. This is the man that would stand over the prisoner with all power and authority over their physical life and say, I can put you to death. Why should I keep you alive? And they, they probably expected him to, to weep and cry and beg for his life. No way. Please don't kill me. Give me another chance. I'll do better. I'll, I'll do whatever it takes. Uh, spare me. What was Jesus doing? Nothing. Silent. Calm. Not afraid of anything. Not afraid of losing his life. He was, he was confident. He's not begging for mercy as every other man he's ever seen had at this point. He was calm. He was relaxed. He was in control. He didn't give his peace away. He held his peace. And he preached in peace. And he had a spirit of peace. Even as he faced certain death. I do believe that Pilate, if you understand their culture, I do believe he thought that Jesus was God or the Son of God or a God. They were probably polytheistic. He had heard these things. He understands the saying uh, that he was the Son of God, the King of the Jews. So I, I, I believe that he... Because if you understand their culture, they probably, a lot of them, they would believe that a man would come that was actually a god. You know, the gods would send somebody down and that sort of thing. So uh, they were probably very superstitious and believed things about men that they probably shouldn't. But their understanding of God was somewhat muddled and distorted. And I believe that he understood the power and authority that Jesus had as he heard of all the amazing miracles from many different witnesses. And he came in, not as a king you would expect, but just in peace, with humility, with kind and gentle words, not a rabble rouser, not causing problems. Uh, if you would, while you're in Matthew 27, go down to verse number 19. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him even his wife is giving him warning like there's something wrong with this situation he hasn't done anything now imagine now go back to uh, john 18 we will be back in matthew 27 in a minute but go to john 18 his wife as he's sitting in the judgment seat the judge gets a, a notice from the wife saying don't touch that guy he's innocent don't have anything to do with him there will be blood on your hands John 18, let's pick back up in verse 36, how Jesus responds to him. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. There's such power in this statement. Number one, he's giving us a glimpse into our future in the millennium as we will be with Christ and we will watch uh, him execute judgment speedily. We will rule and reign with him. I think most of what we'll be doing is watching him execute, but it seems like we'll be uh, some of that will be delegated to us under him. Uh, how that all works, we don't know yet, but it's true. It's a fact that comes in his kingdom. But he also is saying, I think, hey, are you a king? Yeah, I'm a king. Well, where's your uh, servants in your king? Think about what he's saying. If this world were my kingdom, my servants wouldn't let me be right here in this judgment hall. In fact, my servants wouldn't let me be taken by the Jews so that they could deliver me up to you. But this world is not my kingdom. My kingdom is spiritual. He's trying to teach him a lesson here. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that, that I should not be delivered to the Jews but now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, 
Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. He's making it clear. I am a king, and to this end was I born. For this purpose did I come into the world, and here's why I was born, to be a king. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Listen, if you're searching for the ultimate truth, you will find the Lord Jesus Christ as your God, as your Savior, as your Creator, as your only Redeemer. He's the only one. If you're searching for the truth, God will connect all the dots. He will put all the puzzle pieces in place and you will draw Him. You will be drawn unto Him through the Word of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit filled preaching by other people. It's amazing how God works sometimes. And here He's standing before the governor saying, I am a king, but not an earthly one. My king is somewhere else. That's the reason I came here. My kingdom is coming soon. Now, I imagine Pilate was, you're going to come take over my kingdom? You're going to throw us out? You're going to overthrow the Jews? You're going to overthrow the Romans? Well, yes, in time, but not as he thought, right? But he says, I'm here to bear witness of the truth. Well, what was it? He bore witness of the Father. And he, bore, he gave the Father all glory. And what did he say? That the Spirit of truth would come in my name and that the Holy Spirit would live inside of you and that that Spirit uh, would, would prophesy of Jesus after his death. So here he's trying to preach truth to him. Everyone that uh, is of the truth heareth my voice. Look at verse 38. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? Now what a statement. This is a very famous statement. What is truth? It's interesting. Well, they say that you're worthy of death. Is that true? They say you claim to be a king. Is that true? Well, I am a king, and that's why I'm here, to witness of the truth. And here's the fact. I am the Son of God. I am the King of the Jews, and I have came to this world to reveal the truth. And Pilate's like, well, I don't see what they're saying about you is true. And I feel that there's something about what you're saying is true, but I don't think you're guilty of them, but you're not guilty in our court. He's probably totally confused at this point. He's like, what is truth? He's almost like, I almost give up. Like, what are you saying? I don't know what to believe or what not to believe. And again, this was Pilate's opportunity. How many people stood before Jesus and had as much time as they wanted to ask him as many questions as they wanted? And his conversation was more about what are the Jews trying to do? He's probably more worried about his political relationship with the religious crowd outside the door that wouldn't come in because they didn't want to get defiled. Pilate said unto them, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find no fault at all. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore I release unto you the king of the Jews? Now here's what's interesting. Pilate, trying to be a peacemaker in a sense, he says, Hey, you have a custom. Today's the day we can let somebody go. And would, would you like the king of the Jews? I'll give him back to you so that he doesn't have to go through the Roman court process. I don't find any reason to kill him. You want him dead? Let, let's just let him go and forget about this, right? But you know he's guilty. I think Pilate is just as guilty as the Jews here. He's saying, what's guilty to you, but I don't see it. You want to kill him? Go ahead. He's innocent to me. Again, he's kind of saying, what do I care? This is where he washes his hands, and we'll look at that in a second. We're almost done. Uh, look at verse 40. Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. Now, Barab they said, No, not Jesus. Give us Barabbas. Now, uh, if you would go to Matthew 27 again, and we'll finish there. Uh, about Barabbas, I just have a small point here. You think about the guy that they chose. Here it tells us he's a robber. He's also a murderer, and he was actually trying to overthrow the Roman government. He is a man that tried to cause a rebellion. It says in Mark 15, Now at the feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired, and there was one named Barabbas, listen, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And we don't have the details in the Bible, and we don't need Josephus to figure out what's going on. What we're being told is he stole something, probably from the Roman government, weapons, who knows. He caused an insurrection or sedition against the Roman government. The very word is used about him in another chapter, which is accused of Jesus. He was trying to cause a political revolt. This man, Barabbas, steal their weapons. Let's go attack the government. We're going to break free. We'll throw them off. He ended up killing probably some Roman citizens, thereby making him worthy of death. He was bound in the prison, probably awaiting his very death. 
He committed murder in the insurrection, and that's who the Jews chose. We don't want to be defiled. We can't go into the court because we'll be defiled, but we've got our false witnesses we've hired. We've accused him, and we want him murdered. We, we want to murder this man. Oh, and give us back that rebel, the murderer, the thief that loves the Jews that wanted to fight against the Romans. Give us that guy back. It's no wonder Pilate knew their heart in a certain regard elsewhere. He says that he knew that they delivered him for envy. Not jealousy, but for envy. They were envious of the power that Jesus had and they wanted him dead for it. You're in Matthew 27. Let's finish with this. I just want to touch on this last part. Matthew 27, look at verse 24. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing... But that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. He's making this big symbolic scene. He's like, listen, I'm washing my hands, as we often do like this. I'm clean of this. There's no blood on my hands. It's on you. You do whatever you want. I'm innocent here. Now, if he was truly innocent, he would have protected the innocent. Right. Instead of saying... You do whatever you want. You can use the Roman soldiers and our cross and our system and go ahead and do what you want. He was condemning himself and allowing... By not speaking up, you're guilty, right? But by not judging, sometimes you have judged. You're driving fast, here comes a, 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 a... It's green, it's green. Ooh, it's yellow. I don't know, will I make it? I'm not sure I want to make a judgment call. And I run a red. Well, I did make a judgment call. I judge not to stop when I should have, and I ran a rap. You follow what I'm saying? So sometimes by not making a judgment call, you are thereby making a judgment call, which is exactly what he did. He still had blood on his hands. I don't care what he did symbolically. His heart was wrong. He was warned of his wife. He had all these reasons not to. He knew better. He probably even suspected he was of God. And yet he's still, well, you guys go ahead and kill him, but I don't want to do it. Aren't we to deliver those that are drawn unto death? If we're of a true heart, look what he says in verse 25. Matthew 27, 25. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. And on our children. Now this is scary. This is a curse. They're literally saying, that's okay, you washed your hands, you put that blood on us. It's like, I mean, they're literally saying, yeah, we're the murderers, we know it. They've defiled themselves. They know it. They're guilty of it. This is a really scary thought that the blood of somebody would be on you. The Bible calls blood guiltiness. Uh, we see it in the Old Testament where there was blood on your hands. There's blood on your head. You're guilty of something. We see it in the aspect of the gospel. If we withhold from preaching the gospel to somebody, there's blood on us because we didn't deliver them from their sins. We didn't preach the gospel as we ought to. What I find most interesting, just the thought, What's your verdict? Here's my thought for tonight. How do we judge Jesus? How do you judge the judge of the earth? Is there blood on your hands? <laughs> or is there blood on your soul? You know, there's blood on all of us, isn't there? We have already broken his law. We deserve the punishment of death and hell to be cast into the lake of fire, the second death. We deserve that. We've broken his law. And yet we sing about the power of the blood. I want to be covered in the blood. I want, I want uh, to, it will be spotless through his blood. This curse that they put upon themselves, you know, they were literally thinking, I'm going to put myself in a curse. I don't care about that. His blood's on us. But I wonder how many of their children were actually <laughs> saved because of the blood of Jesus. It's kind of neat. God in his awesome mercy and long suffering, they're putting him to death and he's allowing it. He knew it would happen. They're judging him worthy of death, and he's already judged us worthy of death. We're all going to stand before him one day. And thank God, if, if you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you understand that he has taken your punishment, then you don't stand at that great white judgment throne. You will not be cast into the lake of fire. You won't burn for your sins. But you as a Christian have a, a, a responsibility while you're here to use your time for him, and your works will be judged. Whether you're doing good with your works for Christ or whether you're just living selfishly and all of your works will burn up. Again in verse 25. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. 
Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, now wait a minute, I thought he washed his hands. Did you notice that? When he, that's Pilate, scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of the soldiers. We'll stop right there. We, we get more into this in the next chapter. My question to you is, what is your verdict? Every person on earth will judge Jesus. At first glance, you think, who are we to judge the judge of the earth? Who are we to judge the king of the earth? How dare we judge God or put him on trial? But yet that's exactly what every person will do while they're alive in their conscience at some time or even over time. Now it's our job who have believed to go out and deliver the souls. To be a true witness and to deliver the souls and to see lives change for the sake of the gospel. Think about that. Thank God that we're covered in His blood. That blood covered our curse, didn't it? It took away our sins. He knows what He's doing. The most powerful person that's ever walked the earth was judged by men. They judged Him worthy of death when we're already found guilty and worthy of death. Listen, thank God for what He did. Thank God for His patience, His love, His mercy, His long-suffering. As we continue in the next chapter into John 19, Meditate on that. Listen, we don't deserve salvation. It's a gift. Jesus knows what he was doing, and he loves us so much, he took it for us. He didn't even open his mouth and complain about it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for your sacrifice for us. Lord, our verdict is that you are the King of the Jews, that you're the seed of Abraham that's promised to give life. Lord, we believe that you're the Son of Man and the Son of God, and without that, We're nothing. Thank you for laying your life down for our sins. 